the way that I've started thinking about, you know, the definition of quality in modern systems is our ability to change it. Because, you know, I, I, I you know, my engineering shtick at the moment where, you know, I'm, I'm trying to promote the idea of software development as an engineering discipline, mm-hmm. applying scientific style thinking to solving problems. It seems to me that that starting out knowing that we don't know all the answers yet is really important. Assuming that you know whatever answers we've got are probably wrong and may, may change, and maintaining our ability to evolve our thinking and our understanding mm-hmm. is how we get to these more complicated systems that we that we've been talking about so far today. Yeah, and you mentioned so two very important words there, right? It's like the the uncertainty, the change, and also the complexity. So I yeah. have some some quite quite some thoughts on this one. The first one is both of us come. You mentioned at the beginning, right? We come out of sort of the I don't want to say the birthplace, but probably sort of one of the early places where agile, you know, hit hit the mainstream, right? Yeah. Uh, agile development is very much born out of this insight, right? If I know yeah. all the answers and nothing ever changes, I don't need to be agile. I just write it down, I build it, you know, I'm done, yeah. right? Now, that's not the context in which software is being delivered today. So hence, we are very fond of agile methods. And what cracks yeah. me up is that sometimes people come and say, oh, I don't need architecture. Say, oh, you're an architect. That's very nice. But I don't need you because I'm agile. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's quite interesting because <laughs> if you're agile, it means you deal with change and uncertainty. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, lots of change, lots of uncertainty. I'm like, yeah. perfect. So does architecture, right? Because if you yeah. don't have change and you don't have uncertainty, you don't need architecture either. So first big insight is really agility and architecture go hand in hand to deal with a world that has high rates of change and high levels of uncertainty. They go together. They're not opposites at all. I yeah. often say... Yeah, agile is the steering wheel. Architecture is the engine, right? And one keeps you moving, and the other one makes sure you move in the right direction. So that's a common misconception. The other word you said, though, is the complexity. And um, we said, you know, good architecture is making systems ready for change, yes? And this yeah. is absolutely true, but there's always a secondary effect, right? And usually the secondary effect is a negative one. So if you make a system ready for change, it's easy to increase the complexity, right? Yes. So that if you want everything to be changeable, either you reinvent the JVM, you know, no need to do that, right? You can do anything you want, but you didn't deliver much value, right? So no need to do that. Or you drown in complexity, right? And this yeah. is where in our industry, it's sort of a, 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 a status, like a bragging right to have a law. So I felt compelled to also have my own law. So I call it Gregor's law. And that is <laughs> that is that excessive complexity is nature's punishment for organizations who are unable to make decisions. Yeah. So, so the game is that, yes, you want to defer some decisions, right? You want that ability to change, but that deferring has a price and that price is yeah. largely complexity. So, and as architects, we find ourselves right in that middle, like basically, which things can I lock down that bring my complexity down, but that afford me future ability to change. Right? Yeah. Simple examples, right? So let's say people writing software and we don't know what languages they're going to want to use, right? Or they can't agree or it's going to change in the future. You're like, okay, I make a services architecture and I make common APIs, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have common APIs, right, the next service can be written in, in whatever language. Quite honestly, though, what? Well, two main thoughts on this. On one hand, it's one of those classic maneuvers where taking some choice away gives you more choice, right? Yeah. Like I, I, I forced you to make common APIs and I force you to use, you know, JSON and OF and HTTPS, right? I lock many things down, you know, being sort of the old enterprise architect here, right? I standardize some things, but it doesn't take your choice away. It actually increases your choice because now you yeah. can mix and match, you can deploy in the cloud, you can run here, you can run there, different languages, right? So first thing is, it's a classic maneuver of making some decisions enables others, but also to be fair, I increase complexity a little mm-hmm. bit, right? Now you need an API layer, you have partial failures, retries, either potency, out of sequence messages. Um, you have things like, oh, and JSON, the field is missing. Is that the same as null? Is that the same as empty string? Is that like, right? All, all the little fun stuff we deal with all the time, those complexities, yeah. we just all injected into our system. So 
a couple of thoughts of this. On one hand, you know, and as, as I said earlier, I have a hard time with having a definition for architect. And the reason is I have many definitions. So one of the definitions for architects is we are option traders, right? Basically, yeah. what choices do I take away? Because I got to take some choices away. Otherwise, I drown in complexity, Gregor's law. So which choices do I take away? But what choices do I gain in, in, in return, right? That's sort of the classic role of the architect. And the other way of putting this is, so we are sort of the flexibility versus complexity balancers, right? It's yeah. like how much ability to change can we have and how can I do this without complexity, you know, running or spinning out of control? Uh, that's another key role that that architects do. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And again, we are kind of in a hundred percent agreement and talk about it in slightly <laughs> different ways, but, 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 but it's interesting. So, so my, um, my one of my foundational ideas in terms of software engineering principles is that is is the idea of managing complexity so so do making those choices Absolutely. that that allow us give us those freedoms but as you say they incur more work so so i i have some examples in my book where it talks some some little code examples and and i point out that you know, if we're going to go for more modularity better separation of concerns and so on this probably end up with a little bit more code but mm -hmm. it, it makes the system as a whole more flexible and you can deal with it in different ways. And, and so, and I'm talking about the trade-offs between those, you know, those different ideas. I, and I, I'm it, certainly in my head, as you were describing that, I, that's what I was translating it into. I, I think we're yeah. talking about the same idea there, this trade-off between those, those three. You, I, I think that's, that's an insight. It took me a, a, a while to get to, but you've stated it really nicely, which is that is that idea of, of the constraints are a tool that we use to to give us those freedoms in other in, in other areas. So, so there are parts that matter more in in it, it seems to me there are parts of, that matter more in the design of software than than other parts. I don't, you know, the, the 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 idea of something like modules or APIs, the boundaries between them, are more important places in the code than the internal detail of the implementation. The internal detail clearly has to work, but you should be able to change it in a whole variety of ways. Those more important part places need a different kind of thinking, more architectural thinking, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely, right? So just, you know, well, two, two, two comments, right? The one thing is, because this, it, it sounds a bit abstract, but it's like really important, right? This is at yeah. the essence of architecture, but it runs the risk of sort of being labeled as academic again, so that's why I like sort of real life metaphors. Now I worked in financial services. So that's why yeah. the options theory, right? I like options trading, right? Yeah. Sort of what's the strike price? What's the price of the option, right? I use that a lot with my customers because that's stuff they know from the industry domain. Yeah. So if you can do that as an architect, make that translation, it really helps get your concepts across because it's not so easy to put it in the right words. And the second part of it is, of course, I'll bring this back to the the architect elevator. So let's say you're faced exactly with one of those decisions, right? I can I can make this more modular so that affords me a bit more changeability, but I pay some complexity. Like which mm -hmm. which way is better? You as a technical person, you cannot answer that unless you understand the business and the business strategy and the variability yeah. up there. Like you cannot make a good decision about this without understanding the levels above you. And I have a Fantastic example, right? The insurance business, we, we once wrote a um, sort of tablet, really cool stuff, digital, where people can buy insurance, right? And it was really successful. You put your coverage in and then it tells you how much your premium would be. Two months later, or shortly after, great success, the business comes like, oh, we want to do this in the inverse, right? Because Southeast Asia, people have limited budgets. So people want to put in how much premium they're willing to pay. And you're supposed to tell me what coverage you can get. And people are like, oh, it wasn't built that way <laughs> right <laughs> and i went to the business folks and it's like well did you assume that this was like the most obvious next thing and they're like yeah of course totally right it's like yeah. either do it that way or that way it's like same thing right of course right but that hadn't made it to the technical folks of course in the end we like cheated our way out with like some iterating and bisection interpolation right you could sort of right we like sort of you know put some screws on the front <laughs> side right and the end made it work but this was a classic example where the business says of course that's the next thing we're gonna do but the engineering team and they made a really cool calculation engine right it wasn't like they just just hammered it together 
They yeah. really put software engineering effort in, but without knowing what the variability points are. So they yeah. chose a very elegant architecture that's sort of solving the wrong problem. And yeah. that is without knowing what's going up up here, on up here, you cannot make a good technical decision down here because you'd be guessing and you'd be guessing wrong many, many times. This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley, a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring the, you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>